Director, thank you um, to everyone who's staying for this Q&A. I'm Rebecca Priestley and we are here with filmmaker Gwen Isaacs and Susie Wiles, the subject. First, just a round of applause for Gwen. seeing it like this in a documentary, it, it's something else. So thank you, Gwen and Susie. We're going to have a bit of a chat now. I have some questions <coughs> for Gwen and Susie, then I'll open it up to the audience. So start thinking about what you might want to ask. Um, Gwen, first of all, you started following Susie quite early on in the pandemic. And I want to know when, <laughs> when did you start following Susie? And how did you know that this was going to be a big story worthy of a documentary, or at what stage did you realise that? Uh, so I was meant to be making a film about an MMA fighter in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> There's much resemblance to Susie, as you can imagine, but that flight got cancelled uh, out of Auckland, and I had had an email exchange with Susie, and she had said she might be interested in um, participating in a, in a film. So I went left instead of right at the airport, basically, <laughs> to another story I could have followed about another MMA fighter, and went to Susie's house. And that was four days uh, where she put up with me, poking my camera into her face, and um, that became the short documentary, Susie and the Virus. And then thanks to the faith and, um, and support of Philippa Perry, and then eventually Alex Reed, my two fabulous producers, we kept going just and ended up two years later with a film. Um, fabulous. And Susie, as, as shown in the film, you do a lot of science communication, public engagement, and you do often put yourself in it. Your daughter Eve has worked with you on various things, but you've always been in control of the story yourself. How did it feel to hand over that control to someone else? Oh, horrible. <laughs> <laughs> horrible! Um, the, so the reason I agreed uh, to be involved in the first place was because a very good friend of mine, Kinda Rebecca, is, a, is um, a historian, and she had said at the very beginning of the pandemic, this looks like it's going to be really big, can you document everything? And so when Gwen came and said, you know, when I got the email saying, you know, potentially do a documentary, a short documentary, um, I was like, this is perfect, because I have zero time to document anything. Um, this would be really cool, because she can just sort of cap capture the insanity of what's going on. Uh, and that was, uh, yeah, the, that first film. And then um, Gwen was just quite persuasive, and she used her <laughs> feminine wiles to convince me to carry on being followed. Um, I think the reason I agreed was because she lives in Wellington and I live in Auckland, and so I knew that it was going to be a periodic thing rather than like every day, because there would be no film and we lived in the same city, I don't think. Um, yeah, and so, it, but it's, it was, it was, it was really hard to know that, I, I mean, we didn't know what the story, I didn't know what the story was going to be, I guess Gwen didn't really know what the story was going to be at the beginning, or if she did, she didn't really tell me what the story was going to be, and then, to see what emerged, um, I mean, it, yeah, it took great trust, uh, and I'm really grateful that Stephen and Eve um, agreed. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're great. I mean, you see them, they're great, aren't they? When everybody asks me, how do I manage? That's how I manage. And so, you know, I think the, the, the thing we always have to remember is that when you see people doing amazing things, that's because they're surrounded by amazing people support them and so you know this film would have had wouldn't have happened if they had really said no but they are always kind of oh god here she goes again all right <laughs> um, and I'm, I'll always be grateful for that thank you um, one of the things that I noticed in the film and that I know from talking to you is your difficulty getting funding for your research your scientific research to keep on funding your lab and Gwen I was wondering about what parallels there are in the film industry, and, and, and 
I'm hoping there are some people here who, who've helped support Gwen's booster campaign. If we want to put our hands up for anyone who contributed. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So, so Gwen did raise um, more than $100,000 through a crowdfunding boosted campaign. Wow. So Gwen, I want to know what sort of um, led to the decision to do that? At what stage in the process? Was that part of the plan? Or is that just how things panned out? Alex Reed said to me earlier this week that I'll never make a film like this again. And, uh, and, and what she actually meant is, as a producer, it's around the fact that we just had to go, go it alone, Philida, Alex and I, uh, and me, I can never remember. Um, and that meant just DIY, guerrilla style, uh, trusting our gut and thinking that there would be an audience for this film. We were told quite early on by the potential biggest funder in this country that it wasn't really ever going to see the light of day, so it's very gratifying to sit in this room right now. I'm yeah. not going to cry, I promise. Um, so hopefully we prove to them that there is indeed um, an audience for films like this, but uh, in the cinema, which we know is tricky for everybody at the moment. But, um, so we just, uh, I have an incredible institution I work for and they believed in me, so there were grants uh, because it put, my day job is a, a university lecturer and then the crowdfunding and then private investors um, that uh, brought on board mainly by Philida Perry who's magical in that way. She can, she's got many more feminine wiles than me. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any wider comment on the issue of funding for documentaries in this country at the moment? I think they're our tonga. I think that we we don't have documentaries, we have no way of uh, reflecting on our identity and our culture, and they seem to be a business everywhere else, apart from here. Uh, I, I'm passionate about them. It's the, when I was growing up in Kororani here in Kaha North, I, I saw uh, Michael Apted's Seven Up series and knew that's what I wanted to do with my life, and luckily Susie, people like Susie sometimes agree to letting me observe them closely. Um, I just think it's awesome, but I wish people who who can bring money to films and make them happen with less torture and battle than we had agreed with me. Mm. Yeah, well, I think you've heard a lot of supporters here tonight. <laughs> um, Susie, I shed a few tears <laughs> towards the end, and um, it really struck me how much worse things had been than I had known. And um, I know that over the last year or so you've sometimes chosen to keep a bit of a low profile and I'm wondering what's happening for you now that you are <coughs> sort of, you know, hyper visible up on the big screen and how's that feeling? Yeah, it was certainly one of my concerns <laughs> with the film coming out. Um, I guess the thing to say is that um, this is just my life now, so while the filming sort of stopped Years ago, now. 20 to 22. Yeah, um, this is just this is my life now. That um, I'm just a target for people, and uh, you know, even though um, you know, COVID's not, it's we're not in the same space. There's no you know, chance of lockdowns or any of these kinds of things. Um, there are people who are trying to use our COVID early COVID response, um, that, or trying to kind of like rewrite history and trying to. Stop us remembering how, what an amazing response we did have, and how um, how amazing it is when we all come together and do things collectively for the collective good. Yeah. And so the harassment continues, uh, the death threats continue, all of this stuff continues, um, even if I don't do anything. So people still talk about me on all these other social media channels. I'm just I'm just one of the just one of the witches, one of the whatever who they hate. Um, so I still, I'm still, you know, uh, I guess really cautious around my security and, and my safety, um, and I don't know whether that's ever going to go away. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I don't know. I guess, uh, yeah, I don't know. And I, well. we know that um, with the election coming up, there are definitely groups and politicians who are again sort of, you know, using our COVID response as a, a sort of a sort of Thing to try and gather votes, you know, like or, or the, being anti our, our early COVID response, and so that every time some of those people, you know, start going on about lockdowns and blah blah blah, then a whole bunch of harassment <coughs> starts again. So, 
yeah, it just feels like this is it now, but because it feels like a long time ago since we did any of those things. Um, so I hope it goes away eventually. We're going to open things up for some audience questions. So I think we're going to take one of these mics. We'll have a roving mic. So do put your hand up and high. Um, we've got a question here at the front. Um, so Gwen, while we're waiting for this question, um, I was just interested in the music. David Long did the music for this. Can you talk a bit about that collaboration? Going to David's house is so great because he makes an amazing cup of tea, but he does have a dog that's a bit smelly, just for you. Um, he's an incredible, uh, safe pair of hands and very, uh, it, it feels very organic. Um, but at a certain point, I did think he got very busy and I was sort of like, you know, things sped up. But I'm glad, I, I, I think the score just really digs into the emotional journey that you went on, Susie, and that we crafted, uh, John Sylvester, the editor, crafted painstakingly over to best part of one year. Um, so very lucky to have him, and, and also Briar Prestiti did some um, of the score as well. Um, very keen to see more women coming to uh, the forefront of that profession. We've got a question. Oh, where, where is the mic? Okay, sorry. All right. Susie, um, most of us know that Elon Musk um, recently bought out Twitter, renamed the X, and, um, and, and now he started um, boosting all his favourite conspiracy theorists under the guise of what he calls, quote unquote, free speech. Um, do you see yourself remaining on the, on the, on the platform any, in, in, for much longer, or, did, or do you think you're going to um, um, switch to a different platform such as Mastodon or Substack? That's a great question. Um, I definitely am not very active anymore. Um, and I mean, my account has been locked for a long time. So uh, yeah, so I, I now don't get much harassment on social media because I just, <laughs> people just don't see it. Um, and I would like to, I, I guess I just need a bit of time to start figuring out how those other ones work. I mean, you know, some, I've been using, I'm going to keep calling it Twitter, I've been using it for a long time, and so it's kind of sad when one of your favourite things gets broken by somebody. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, but I feel old, and I need to learn how to use all the other ones. When, when oh, maybe um, in my summer holidays, <laughs> whatever platform is available, then I might start learning how to use <laughs> Okay, we've got a question here. First of all, thank you, Susie, for everything that you did for us. Um, I, the, my question is... Uh, you were also around um, a number of men that was also giving um, scientific advice. Were they also getting abuse? It's a great question. Um, so, abs yes, they um, definitely um, have become targets as well. Uh, but the people who study this say there's definitely a gendered aspect to it. So, um, as a woman, I get more. As a fat woman, I get more. As a loud woman, I get more. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's, as a society, we, um, have, for hundreds and hundreds of years, have pushed back against women who don't, you know, who break societal norms. So the harassment we experience is just like that much more. Um, and the th things people feel comfortable saying to us, writing to us, um, are that much more. So, uh, yes, so it absolutely, I know that, that people are saying horrible things about the others too, but my understanding is that some of the things that are said about me and other women like um, our former prime minister are that much worse. Hey, do we have the mic with someone else? Yes, yes. Sure. Um, Thanks so much, Susie and Gwen. Um, amazing work. And this is a question, I guess, for you, Rebecca, because as, a, as someone who does study science communication, um, if not communicate yourself very well, um, it, it's actually, what do you think, because I think the film does not ex sort of explain the world outside of it's very much about Susie's experience, and I'm interested in what, what would have happened with it to us without Susie's communication? I think it would 
I'd follow what Susie said in the film, was if it, if it wasn't me, then the questions would be going to someone else. And the danger, I think, is, I think, maybe Sean Hendy said this, or, or no, you said this, Susie, if not me, then who? Um, and I'm going to hand this on to Susie. <laughs> I mean, there are, so, so there are times when I didn't take media interviews, and then the people who were asked completely changed the tone of, the, of how the story played out. So, you know, what I was trying to do in those early days was remain calm, you know, what, what, and it's all based on the fact that the evidence shows that if we panic, we don't act in our best interests. And the evidence also shows that those communities who come through disasters better are the ones who work together. So those were the two things I was trying to really uh, kind of bring to the fore in my communication was to be calm and to kind of just keep um, addressing that kind of collective action. And so times when I didn't pick up the phone, the, you know, this, the, whatever it was that was being presented ended up being kind of more fear-mongering than it needed to be, <laughs> you know, so, um, I mean, it's a hard thing to say, you know, but I, I did what I did, I mean, I know that um, what's not really touched on much in the film is my collaboration with Toby Morris, and, um, you know, that was a collaboration that went completely global, you know, our, our graphics were used by people all around the world who needed it far more than we did to know how could they protect themselves, right? We had all sorts of protections in place that the government put in place. Um, so, I think it's a, you know, I guess this is a, a thing that people will be, historians will study for years, uh, and I guess we'll find out in their papers in years to come just what a role all of us played. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that we had good information, we had leaders that were willing to act on it, and we had people who knew, you know, what was at stake and were willing to do the right thing, I think it was a really good combination. And it, I think what we've seen from countries overseas is that if you lose any one of those, if you don't have good communication, if you don't have good leadership, or if you don't have a willing populace, um, it was a very different pandemic experience for what we did. Thanks, we've got a question here, Richard. <laughs> Thanks, Rebecca. Um, you made some, uh, an understanding statement about the people who had bullied you and beaten you up. Do you have a similar thing to say about the people who are criticizing you so viciously online? I, how do you understand them, and what do you what have you learned about them over the last two years? So I guess this um, I would put my harassers into um, at least two groups. So there are those those people who are creating um, information or a, uh, basically using me as a as a way to uh, further their agenda, right? So there are people who make up lies about me or who, um, you know, take something with a grain of truth and then turn it into something horrible, um, all because they're trying to make money or they're trying to convince people of something that will further their agenda. For them, I have nothing but loathing um, and a deep desire to see them, uh, to see justice, basically, to see them stopped because what they are doing is dangerous for all of us. For the people who fall for that shit, though, um, I mean, I have sympathy, right? There are, there are really genuine reasons why people have grievances about what happened to us. I mean, you know, we've all experienced the most astonishing, outlandish thing, right? And, and I guess we've, you know, we've experienced pandemics before um, that just haven't played out this way because this virus is very different to everything else we've encountered. And so, you know, people who have historically had bad interactions with the state, you know, or who um, have had bad interactions with doctors, you know, there are many people who have grievances or have, or are uneasy about authority, who have just been really willing receptacles for that shit and for being, uh, you know, abused in that way. And so for them, I feel utter sympathy because actually many of them now are living in an alternate reality, one where they have lost friends and family, and they are just being played, and they don't realize they're being played, and that is just heartbreaking. Well, yeah. So, as a follow-up to that, <laughs> with my scientist hat on, um, the, the really important thing we know from the evidence is that the group, the second group that are heartbreaking, um, the people who will convince them, who will change their minds, are their friends and family. 
So I guess try not to give up on those people um, and try to bring them back to the fold because we know that we, we face some horrendous challenges uh, in our future, climate change and various other things. And we also know that many of the solutions to those and, uh, are being roundly attacked. <laughs> And so we need everybody on board to kind of deal with those things. And so we will need those people who have a conspiratorial mindset to be sort of brought, you know, back into the fold. And so if those people are in your lives, um, I know it's probably really hard, but, uh, you know, try to remind them why you love them and that you care about them, because the evidence shows that you're the one who can change their mind. Kia ora. Um, this is, I guess, a question for both Gwen and Susie. Um, this movie is a really brave thing for both of you to have done, and you, you have the support of your, your whānau and friends and so on, but I was really struck in the movie with the scene when you're talking to the lawyer, Susie, and uh, you say that your HR department didn't really appreciate what was happening. Um, and, you know, you both in your day jobs, work for organisations, as many people do. What are the kind of things that organisations can do or, or could be doing to support women like yourselves? Uh, right, that's a massive question. Um, just going back to Susie, <laughs> I think, do you mean support in terms of safety? I don't personally feel unsafe in my workplace, uh, and I think that's that's quite an extreme thing that plays out in the film. Um, most of us hopefully don't experience. Not just safety, but also in terms of supporting your message, packing your carpet, all those kinds of things. You know, even day to day, what can help? What did help? You mean, is it a gender question? Uh, are you talking about, I think, Susie's. Okay. Um, so I'm going to start by saying, because you, 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 you asked what they can do to help and what they did do to help. So I'm just going to be quite provocative and say that uh, when I ask the question, what did they do to help, the only way I can answer that question is to say that I'm in a legal dispute with my employer and we were, are heading, hopefully, to the employment court in November. So you will understand more about what they did to support me in November, if that becomes public knowledge. Um, what they could do, what organisations could do, is they need to understand that this is our reality now. And it's not just academics, right, it's everybody. It's politicians, it's decision makers. The reality now is that we have a, an, an online environment that is, um, that is being manipulated, and we know this is being manipulated from things that Facebook did many years ago, right, to, to turning elections. So we know that vast platforms where we get much of our information uh, are basically there to manipulate us. And we know that online hatred can turn into offline um, a, a hurt. There have been deaths in other countries, right, where, um, where politicians and various other things. So the first thing is to understand the environment that we live and work in now and to absolutely get the thing that online abuse can turn into real world abuse and hurt. Because that is the thing that I have struggled <laughs> to get people to really understand. And I think once you understand that there is a real, you know, there's not just people being nasty on social media, there is a risk that we will be harmed in real life. Then it sets in, in train a whole bunch of other stuff, you know, and, and you don't ask people like me, you ask people who know about security and safety, <laughs> you ask the experts, what can you do to support your staff who are potentially facing real world harm? Um, so, yeah, ask the experts. We've got a question down the front. Excuse me while I get up. I just wanted to uh, say two things. First, I'm so sorry, Susie, that you had to undergo all that crap. <laughs> um, somewhat naive, so I was also surprised when our dear leader, no reference to North Korea, um, Jacinda 
departed so um, for me precipitously but I hadn't realized that she'd also undergone such harassment that's the first thing and then I wanted to reiterate my gratitude that you came to over zoom speak to an organization in Wellington that I'm secretary of graduate women Wellington and my sense of time has just done really weird things, so I can't remember if it was 2021 or 2022. But we were really fortunate, privileged indeed, to have you zoom in and address us. So thank you once again. It's a pleasure. And, and yeah, I'm really bad at saying no to things. <laughs> So, so much so that I, a friend of mine um, uh, made me a jar that she filled with beautiful little notes and she calls it my yes no jar and she says that I'm supposed, when I get asked to do something I'm supposed to pick a note out and it will tell me whether or not I can do something and um, the trick is that it's almost entirely no's. <laughs> Uh, and, and the same, my daughter um, bought me uh, for Christmas one year a no button that every time you press it, it says no different ways. So <laughs> I'm really bad. And she will say, have you used your no button? I'm like, oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, we've got time for one more question and it's going to be for the filmmaker. Yes. <laughs> Is there a question for Gwen? Can I just quickly say a big thank you to the New Zealand International Film Festival. You are wonderful people and it's thanks to you guys uh, accepting the film to the festival that catalyzed the finishing fund that we got from the uh, from the New Zealand Film Commission. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys. set up in, set in the far north uh, about a mystery from my own childhood that took place in the 80s. Uh, so it's one of those films about, you know, self-reflexive. <laughs> It'll be a laugh riot like this one, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Super, thanks everyone for staying on and a big clap for Gwen.